find a reason in this Bible why I should not be here and I'll leave. My grandmother's church was having a revival. And during this revival, they had invited an evangelist to come speak. And one evening, my grandmother met the evangelist before the service was over and asked her to go visit my granddad the next day after he got off at work to go meet him at home and invite him to the revival to talk to him about Jesus. Now, my granddad was born in extreme poverty. His dad was an alcoholic. He grew up in a family full of tragedy. I think he had 10 brothers and sisters, and most of them died in car accidents. A lot of those car accidents involved alcohol. And he married my grandmother when she was 15 years old. And she attended church, but he did not. And he absolutely refused to go to church. And so as he saw the the preacher coming up to his house, he met him at the door. He knew what he was there for, the way he was dressed. He knew who he was, and he met him at the door with a few choice words, telling him to get off of his property. And then the evangelist left, but then came back the next day. And this time, my granddad met him. He said he was ready to fight him. He said he hadn't learned his lesson. He doesn't know who he's messing with. So he was ready to fight. And he said, I told you never to come back to my house. And he saw the Bible in the man's hand. And he said, I know what that Bible says. And so the the preacher handed my granddad the Bible and says, if you know what it says, then find one reason in this Bible why I shouldn't be here and why I should leave. That was an interesting question. And my granddad, very prideful at the time, grabbed the Bible, said he didn't know anything about the Bible, started flipping through the pages and realized he had no clue what the Bible was about and just stared at him. And the evangelist took the Bible back and began to share the gospel with him. And at the end of the conversation, convinced him to come to the revival that night. My granddad went to the revival three nights in a row before on the last night of the revival, there was a response time. He heard the gospel, the Spirit of God moved in his heart, and he came forward and trusted Christ alone for salvation. I think about that story a lot because it has everything to do with why I'm standing here right now. My family took a different, drastic turn. My grandparents made sure that I was in church every Sunday and every Wednesday and every time the doors were open at all times. They served their church faithfully. My granddad became a churchman. He was a deacon. He shared the gospel with everyone he came in contact with. He never got past that moment that someone would come knock on his door and plead with him to believe the gospel. And so he did the same his whole life. It has everything to do with why I'm standing here. And as Cain stands over his brother with a knife soaked in blood, the decision of his parents to disregard the warning of God, you shall surely die, has everything to do with why he's standing there. Genesis chapter 3 has everything to do with Genesis chapter 4. Why would Cain kill Abel? It's because God warned his parents, if you sin, you will surely die. And Adam sinned. And he separated himself from God. He believed the lies of the snake, the lies of sin. He trusted the word of sin more than he trusted the word of God. And immediately we get into Genesis chapter 4. And this issue of sin and death It spirals into this deep, dark place. 
horrific place. As Cain kills his brother Abel. We know how we got here. We know why we are here. Because the truth is, we feel it in our own hearts. We understand what's happening here. Because we know it in our own thoughts. The question is, are we willing to admit it? Are we willing to admit that we are here in our sin because of Adam and Eve's decision, which has led to our own decisions. Notice verse 1 of chapter 4. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Now at first, this sounds right and good. God promised Eve, despite the curse of sin and death in the world, you will still bring life into the world. And Adam even named her Eve, the mother of all living, because she would bring life into the world. And that seems to be what's going on here. But the phrase here, even as we read it, I got a man with the help of the Lord. It's really an emphasis on what she has done. There's pride in what has gone on here. In some sense, Eve is saying, I did this, and I brought the seed that will crush the serpent's head into the world. It doesn't sound like any other prayer that we hear from a mom throughout the rest of the Scripture when they are praising God for the blessing of children. It's odd. It's different. But Notice verse 2, and again, she bore his brother Abel. And what's interesting about Abel's name is it means vapor. His life was a vapor. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. And we are to immediately notice the difference in the two brothers. Cain, who is literally the firstborn, the firstborn human in the world. He's a farmer. He works the ground. Now, why is that significant? Because his identity is associated with the curse. What did God tell Adam? You are going to labor. You are going to work. You are going to sweat through thorns and thistles to bring forth life and provision in the world. Cain is associated with the curse. And every day is fighting through the thorns and thistles. But Abel is a shepherd. Now why is that significant? How did Genesis chapter 3 end? With Adam and Eve leaving the garden with animal skins on their back. God had provided an animal sacrifice for their sins. And so what is Cain doing all the days of his life? He is raising livestock that will be sacrificed for his sin. For the sins of those who have rebelled against God. This is his identity associated with the sacrifice for sin. Notice verse 3. Here we begin to see that a lack of faith leads to disobedience. We see the identity of the two brothers. And then we see how this is carried out in verse 3. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And that sounds really good, right? This is what he does. He works the ground. He brings forth produce. He brings forth vegetables. And so he brings his vegetables to the Lord. But then Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. Now we read that. And we're to consider what God would require of Israel later, specifically in the book of Exodus, that they would bring the firstborn, the best. They they were to bring 
lambs without blemish to declare that God was priority and God deserved the best. And the fat portions of the animals were to be, born, were to be burned as an offering that God would accept a sweet-smelling aroma. And so in Abel's offering, there's all kinds of allusions to the sacrificial system that God required. And so Cain brings forth his vegetables. Abel brings forth what God had required. It's probable that Adam and Eve had taught their family how to worship the Lord. And part of worshiping the Lord is bringing forth an animal sacrifice that Abel gets to raise and bring before the Lord. And you can only imagine Cain seeing this go on his whole life and seeing the prestige of Abel's identity before the Lord. He gets to raise and work and bring forth the provision for their sins. And notice as the verse continues, and the Lord had regard for Abel's offering, the animal sacrifice, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. The word regard means to look on with favor, to gaze upon. Abel brings forth his sacrifice and God gazes upon it and accepts it as an offering. But Cain's, he doesn't accept. And we ask, why? Why wouldn't God accept a man's pumpkin? Why? Well, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4 says, by faith. Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. So first of all, we see that Abel brought forth his sacrifice by faith. And what did that look like? Well, his faith led to him obeying God with the required sacrifice. God had required an animal sacrifice. And so because Abel trusted God and believed God was holy and righteous and he sinned against him, but this is the requirement for my sin, he trusted God and brought forth the right sacrifice. And it seems as though on this day, Cain had had enough. It's very possible Cain had offered animal sacrifice up until this day. He'd probably trade it with his brother Abel for a lamb, a goat. But on this day, he says, no, no, my, my vegetables are enough. I'm going to bring whatever I want today. And God will have to get over it. We see Abel had a humble faith before God, trusting his requirements, not expecting anything in return. But Cain said, I'll do it my way today, and God will have to get over it. And I wonder if that's you here today. I wonder if that's the sort of faith you have right now. You're thinking, God's lucky I just got up today. All the rigmarole I have to go through to get here. And I'm here. And I'm listening. And I'm singing. I even served some today. And you're thinking today, because of all you've done, you've got God over a barrel. He's got to do whatever you want because of your measly service to Him. And you're saying in your mind, that's enough. That's enough. Unlike Abel, who says, no, God deserves the best. He deserves my time, my energy, my resources. I can't give God enough. He is a holy God. This is what you should say, a holy God that I have sinned against. He is righteous. He's revealed himself in his word. Oh God, how would you have me come worship you today? I don't deserve to be here today. How are you approaching God today? Prideful, arrogance, or humble faith? But we see the lack of faith leads to disobedience. This is why Cain disobeyed. And then we see lack of repentance leads to a hard heart. Notice as the text continues. So Cain was very angry. He didn't say, okay, my bad. Let me, let, me, let me make this right. God doesn't accept my sacrifice, and he fumes. He accepted Abel's, 
He's angry. And notice how it's described. His face fell. Remember back in chapter 2, we are to know God face to face, and yet in anger, he turns his face from God. Wants to have nothing to do with God. God is the one who rejected his sacrifice. But notice verse 6. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Remember last chapter, all the questions God has for us. God pursues us in our sin. Whatever happened at the altar, Cain should have been destroyed and wiped out. And yet God allows him to live And then begins to question his heart. Cain, why are you angry? Let's reason together. Let's talk. The same way he approached Adam and said, why are you hiding? The answer is because I've sinned. That's not the answer he gives. And so God instructs him. He says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? If you brought forth by faith the sacrifice that I required, would it not be accepted? The answer is yes. If you'd have just done what was required. And if you do not do well, meaning if now you don't repent of your frustration and anger, the emotions going on in your heart because your offering wasn't accepted, if you don't check yourself before you wreck yourself, This is leading in a way you don't want to go, Cain. God God is warning him and he's instructing him and he's getting into his heart. Why are you angry? Why don't you repent of your anger? Why don't you turn and do the right thing? Because if you don't, notice sin is crouching at the door. Sin is ready to pounce and attack, defeat, dominate, and destroy you. That's what sin's going to do to you. And and we think the emotions in our heart are no big deal. God thinks they're a big deal because he knows where they're, he knows where they're headed. He says, it's like a lion ready to destroy you. Its desire is against you. Contrary, your own heart is warring against you, but you must rule over it. Back to chapter one and two, you must subdue it. You must have dominion over it. The sin in your heart. Notice God's warning of sin. You see, we like sinful emotion. We like to feel that way. The anger, the lust, the frustration, the the sort of venting feelings we have, they feel controllable, don't they? Like a sinful buzz. I'm not intoxicated on sin just yet, but I kind of like feeling that way. I like sulking. I like being irritated. I like giving others the silent treatment. That makes me feel good. And we think we're in control of it. But God says, no, no, no. That heart is dangerous. You're playing with your sin like it's a declawed domestic cat. That's just fun. He says, no, sin is a lion ready to take its massive paws, slap you in the face, pin you to the ground, destroy you and rip you to shreds. That's what you're playing with, with those desires in your heart. Whether you believe it or not, that's what you're toying with. And you can't domesticate your sin. You can't control it even though you think you can because God will eventually allow your desires to have their way. Notice verse 8. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. Hey man, let's talk. I want to see some of the livestock that you have out here. I want to see how you do things. Yeah, I know the other day in worship, kind of lost my mind, went astray. Let's talk about these animals. And when they were in the field, notice Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. It escalates really quickly, right? Just kind of pouting. And we think God's saying, don't be mad, little buddy. No, he's saying you're about to destroy some things. And the first thing he destroys is his brother's life. 
kills his brother, murders him, plans it, takes him out into the field. The knife that he should have cut the animal sacrifice's throat with, kills his brother with, kills him. Why? Why did that happen? Well, God allowed his desires to go full course. God allowed that, right? God had warned him, no, 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 you're about to be destroyed. He did not repent. God says, okay, and allows him to kill his brother. And there is the sacrifice that is consistent with his heart lying on the ground as his brother soaked in his own blood. This is the sacrifice of Cain's heart. And this is why 1 John chapter 3, verse 12 says, We should not be like Cain, who was the evil one and murdered his brother. And you would say, yeah. John, that, that's not hard to understand. Don't be like Cain. That's one of the easiest biblical principles we could apply to our life, right? Don't kill people. But I think a good question for everybody here today is, how are we like Cain? How are we like Cain? See, I'd never be so angry to kill someone. You know what Jesus says about your anger? He says, if you are angry against your brother, you are guilty of murder. To fume and irritation, just like he would say about lust. If you lust after another woman, you are guilty of adultery. Why would Jesus say that? Because the issue is in your heart. That's what God was trying to tell Cain. Your heart is desperately wicked. And if you don't turn from what's going on in your heart, your desires will turn into action. That's why Jesus gets to the heart. And you know this, right? Because you fume at the person at work who got the promotion that you didn't get. In a moment of rage, when the, when the ref misses the call, ah! and you go, okay, that was a little too much. But it was there, right? It was there. That rage is there inside of you. When you think about your worst political opponent, and you dream of the most horrific thing in the world to happen to them. That they just would not exist anymore. And those thoughts and those desires are in your heart. You are like Cain. Cain was just allowed to make the sacrifice consistent with his heart. And thank God he doesn't turn you loose with your desires. Stop and thank God for those Horrible, wicked things you have wanted and longed for and thought. The anger, the lust, daydreaming about a different life with another spouse. The sort of buzz you get on that app that you know you would want no one else to see that you're looking at. What if God said, okay, you, you desire that? Here you go. That's God's grace in your life that He hasn't allowed you to carry out the worst desires of your heart. But notice, Cain continues to walk down this path and we see next, lack of faith, a disobedient hard heart leads to hatred of God. Notice verse 9, then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother? Again, God knows where he is. This is like the parent. Why is there a dent in your car door? We know why there's a dent in your car door. Why is your sister crying? We know. Why are you hiding your phone? You know. And God knows. This is for Cain's benefit. That he would still, God is so gracious and kind. If you don't get that in Genesis 3 and 4, he just keeps coming. 
Would you please repent? Would you please turn from your sin? And he gives Cain another chance. But notice his response. I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Whoa. You going to talk to God like that? You going to talk to God like that? In this moment, he hates God's presence. He doesn't want anything to do with God. Why are you talking to me about my brother? Why are you bringing that up? God, you're the idiot. That's a stupid question. It's your fault for bringing it up. You think I'm supposed to take care of him all the time? But notice verse 10, God knows. What have you done? What have you done? As the Lord stares at the blood on the ground, he says this, your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. You see, Cain was worse than his parents. They gave a lot of excuses. Cain just flat out lies. And the Lord can see his lie. He says, your brother's blood is crying out your guilt. Am I my brother's keeper? The answer is yes. In context, Abel's name is mentioned seven times. Cain's 14 and the word brother seven. It's the scripture's way of saying, yes, you are your brother's keeper. And you killed him. You killed him. You see, in verse 11, eventually you get what you want. Lack of faith, disobedience, hard heart. God allows the heart to do what it wants and you are left with what you wanted in the first place. Notice verse 11. And now you are cursed from the ground. This is, you are, you are moved even further from the ground. We think about the garden. Mankind is moving further from the garden. But the ground here, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. It will not help you. The ground will not help you live anymore. You will not be able to find provision in the ground. And this was his identity. The worker of the ground sowed his brother's blood in the ground. And so now he is going to reap what he sowed. Death. Dust. The ground will give you nothing, Cain. But even more, you shall be a fugitive. You will live all the days of your life being known as the man who killed his brother. And you will be a wanderer. You will have no home. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. And there are millions in hell saying the same thing today. It's too late. For Cain, he's been turned over to his sinful desires and shunned from the Lord. And there is a desperate plea, but it is too late for him. And he says, behold, you have been driven, driven me away today. Again, this goes back to Genesis 3, like driving cattle. This is fury. This is force. God is driving him away. And notice he says, and from your face shall I be hidden. Now he understands there was mercy before the Lord. And, and we lived in His presence and we enjoyed fellowship with the Lord. And now I'm going to be driven from that because I allowed sin to rule my heart and take over. And then He says, I shall be a fugitive and a wonder on earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. There will be vengeance taken against me, Lord. Notice this is kind of a last ditch. Let me, let me try to get some mercy here. Don't you know what you're sending me out to? It's dangerous out there. Someone's going to kill me. You mean the way you killed your brother? The way you murdered your brother? Now you're worried about that? Now you're an advocate for thou shalt not kill? But notice God's grace. Not so. 
If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And we see throughout the curses always have grace. This is a curse. He has to live with this guilt. But God allows him to live and even issues a warning. If anyone kills him, vengeance will be taken upon him. And so the Lord put a mark on Cain and anyone who found him, if they should attack him, he would be protected. And in verse 16, then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. And we're moving west to east. The word for Nod means wanderer, it's just kind of a place of wandering. But we're moving further and further away from the garden because of sin. And he's just marked out. We don't know if this was the first tattoo. If you want to argue that it is, it's probably not a good thing. But this is just an indication. Do not mess with Cain. However it was indicated. But just like the snake was marked out to crawl on the ground, Cain is marked out to live this wandering life as a fugitive, always guilty, and there's no mercy, there's no justice for his sin. Haunted all the days of his life. And we see very clearly, you will reap what you sow. Sin brings forth death. We haven't learned anything yet. That is the principle. You will reap what you sow. If you sin, you will bring forth death in your life. And it's not always this one-to-one where if I lie, I'm going to get in a car wreck today. No, we see the picture of death in the first four chapters. Meaning when we choose to sin, we are severing ourselves from God. That's what death is. And you sow into that relationship as you sin death. You continue to sever your relationship with God. And God is patient all along. He's correcting. He's warning. But the one who has true faith will not reject his warning. They will not continue to sow death and reap eternal death and be done with God. The fake son, the false son, the son without faith will just continue to reject until he's absolutely walking away from God and doesn't care anymore. And I wonder if that's you today. I wonder if you're the one here with a lack of faith and you've been confronted with the reality That you can serve self or serve Jesus, but you don't trust God enough to serve Jesus. And so you keep serving yourself when it comes to your time, resources, relationships, priorities in life, and you just keep believing, if I serve myself, if I serve myself, and no, the word of God in the gospel says, no, take up your cross and follow Jesus. Take up your cross and follow him. Trust in him and follow him. But you keep rejecting that. And what happened to Cain in his disobedience? His heart grew harder until he was angry with God. And the next step for some of us is that you're going to be angry with God and then God's just going to allow your desires to take hold and you're going to walk away from God forever. God's going to allow that to happen. And so the question for you is, what are you sowing in your life? When you're convicted of grumbling and complaining. When you're convicted of apathy by the word of God that comes into your heart and you you feel that conviction. Do you just dig in even more and get more irritated with God? Or do you confess and repent and turn to Christ and follow Him? When the Spirit says stop enjoying the security of the conversation with the person that is not your spouse. You get irritated by that? Or do you turn from that? What about the one here today who has heard the gospel over and over and over again? Your friend at school keeps keeps sharing this Jesus story with you, pleading with you to believe the gospel. They invited you to church today. Or the one who just keeps coming because you just kind of like these people and you kind of like this mood here. 
Church in a warehouse, that's cool. But every time we say you need to turn from your sin and turn to Christ, that irritates you. Be warned. Be warned. That heart gets harder and harder and harder till you will not hear it again. You may hear some mumbling sounds in the distance as people plead with you to turn to Christ, but your heart won't hear it. And God will allow you to have your desires, which is, I don't want to be close to those people and I don't want to have anything to do with him. What if God allowed that for you? Again, we should not be like Cain. We should turn from our sin. But we also see one of the points 1 John makes here is is that Abel was the first Christian martyr. This is fascinating. Abel was killed for his faithful worship to Cain or, or due to Cain's fury over his offering. Cain grew up watching Abel tend the sheep, and as he fought thorns and thistles and worked, and Cain showed up for worship, maybe having to trade his pumpkins with Abel's livestock, and it just irritated him. He finally exploded in anger. And he killed Abel for his worship. It's the same thing that happened to Jesus, right? Jesus shows up on the scene and the religious leaders, they have their whole system of worship. And they are sure that they are God's people and this is acceptable. And Jesus shows up on the scene and says, no, 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 no. It's not about your self-righteousness. I am the way. I am the truth and the life. And you, you must believe in me to have eternal life. And what did they do to Jesus? They killed their brother. They killed him. And then so Jesus would turn to us and say, if you follow and worship me, the same way they hated me, they will hate you. Abel is the first martyr. And so we are to trust God even when the world hates us, even when the most religious hate us. We're to do what God has called us to do. But there's another reason we must be like Abel. You must be like Abel today because you have Cain's heart. And hopefully that's obvious to you. Is that that sin is there. The potential to harden your heart to God and walk away from Him, that is there. And that's why you must be like Abel. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4 says, Through his faith, Though he died, he still speaks through his faith. And what would Abel say to you today? What would Abel's faith say to you? Notice Abel has not said a word through the whole thing. Only his blood has spoken of his brother's guilt. But what would Abel say to you today? He would say, have faith in what God has provided. Bring before the Lord the required sacrifice. No matter what it costs you, even if it costs you your life, bring before the Lord the acceptable sacrifice. And what is the acceptable sacrifice? Well, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24 says this, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. What is the acceptable sacrifice that Abel would say Bring to the Lord today the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, the blood of Abel spoke of his brother's guilt. And the blood of Jesus today, make no mistake, speaks of your guilt. In some sense, you are Cain who killed your brother, your brother Jesus. Because your sin held him there. Your sin nailed him to the cross. He died willingly for your sin. And his blood declares you are guilty of infinite sin of God, against God. But how does the blood of Jesus speak a better word? The blood of Jesus speaks a better word. Because by faith, though you are guilty, your guilt was placed on him. And you can be 
cleansed of that sinful, wicked heart. And you can be forgiven of all the sins you have committed against God now and forever if you would believe in His cross and trust in His righteousness. But you can be like Cain today. You can say, no, 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 I'm good. I do a lot of good things. And I can come to God, however, that's between me and God. I I don't need Jesus. I don't need to just believe the way you're telling me to believe that Jesus is the only way. You don't know me. I'm a good guy. Cain thought he was a good guy until that day in worship, and it was revealed he wasn't. And so something is being revealed in your own heart today. Are you going to trust in Jesus? Are you going to trust in your own righteousness? Are you going to listen to Abel's faith and offer what God demands? Nothing but the blood. That decision will affect the rest of this day, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. Year after year after year after year, the decision before you today will affect generations. Just like Adam and Eve, just like Cain. Your life will continue to speak. What will it say? Because God comes to you today and he asks the question, where is your brother? For those in Christ, you can say, I killed him. My sin killed him. I hope you're okay with saying that. Your sin killed the son of God. Crushed him under the wrath of God. But his blood screamed out not of his own guilt, but your guilt, which you can be forgiven of by trusting in him. Where is your brother? I killed him, but now he's at the right hand of God and he offers me an eternal kingdom. And there's a question for Jesus today. Where are your brothers and sisters? Covered in my blood and righteousness. I am my brother's keeper.